Hi, I'm Danielle Roberts, and you are listening to The Giving Town Podcast, where we share stories of hope and generosity in our wonderful community of Newburgh, Oregon, and the surrounding area. This podcast is sponsored by my real estate team, The Driftful Roberts Group, and we are licensed real estate brokers with Premier Property Group, LLC. We're passionate about serving our clients well and also educating people about the many aspects of real estate, which is why we've created a YouTube channel that does just that. We discuss real estate tips, buyer and seller guides, market reports, as well as what makes Newburgh a great place to live in addition to so many other great topics. So if that's something you're interested in, you can check out our YouTube channel, which is linked in the description in this episode. So today I'm talking to Larry Strober. He's a fellow Rotarian in the Newburgh Noon Rotary Club with me, and we'll be discussing how Larry got involved in Rotary, some of the projects he works on, as well as why this work is so important to him. Larry really exemplifies what it means to be a Rotarian, so I hope you enjoy and are inspired by today's episode. Hey everyone, I am here with Larry Strober, who is a fellow Rotarian with me in uh, the Newburgh Noon Rotary Club. So today we're going to be talking about uh, some of Larry's past, some of his background, how he's been involved with Rotary, and what his life looks like as a Rotarian. And we were talking, uh, or actually I guess recently Larry shared at our club about a lot of the different things that he's been involved with, uh, both locally and really throughout throughout the world. So today's going to be sharing some of that. So Larry, thank you so much for joining me today. I think there's going to be a lot of great information we have to share. Yeah, pleasure being here. So, so first off, can you share a little bit about um, your background and what led you to be so involved in the community? Uh, well, it wasn't always that way. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I spent my first 20 years there. Um, Brooklyn, everyone has an identity with Brooklyn, but Br- Brooklyn wasn't community uh, or it was two and a half million people community. <laughs> Uh, went on to Bucknell University, um, and then got involved in an interesting project uh, in the Army with the Satellite Communication Agency. Mm. I was a first lieutenant and um, wound up um, helping set up the first defense communication satellite project for the for the government. It was the first time uh, leaders of the free world can actually talk to each other on a secure network. Oh, wow. And um, it, it kind of gave me a sense that I, I could make things happen. I could I yeah. make a difference. In fact, I wear a rotary pin every day that says making a difference, uh, which was a, um, a a logo or motto of one of our past presidents. So that kind of gave me a sense and, and allowed me to get into uh, Silicon Valley and uh establish a career working with startups. I did that for quite a number of years, uh, living in San Rafael, California, raised two boys. And, and, and the sense of satisfaction I got working with startups was like it, it, one with MicroPro, with WordStar. We wound up with 400 to 500 employees. And I had a sense of satisfaction that I helped create this job market yeah. for 400, 500 people. And other companies weren't as large, but you know, 20 people here, 50 people there. And it, it, it's different than the satisfaction one gets with uh, service above self, which is the rotary motto. But um, around 10 years ago, um, I, was a, I moved to Oregon, uh, mainly because there are three grandkids that are not very far away. But continued to do my work with startups um, and joined the McMinnville Chamber of Commerce. And then one day at a chamber meeting, Kelly Mankey, who is now the president of the city council in McMinnville, said, what are you doing next Wednesday morning? Um, Said, hey, I don't do anything on Wednesday mornings. She said, come to breakfast with me. So I went to the McMinnville Sunrise Club. Um... Seven o'clock in the morning, I actually got there a quarter to seven, and um, they had a, an interesting program, met a number of people, and I went home, and I remember telling my wife that I just met 30 friends. Hmm. So 30 days later, I joined the McMinnville Sunrise Club. And now the Sunrise Club was a, a rotary club? It's a rotary club, yeah, with about 30 members. 
a small Rotary Club. There are two Rotary Clubs in McMinnville. Um, became president um, two years later. Became assistant governor two years later, and I was assistant governor for three years, and got involved with Mike Caruso at the Newburgh Club doing peace projects. Hmm. So um, we got involved planting peace poles. I ran the McMinnville Peace Village, which uh, I wanted to prove to some people at Rotary that all of the spokes of Rotary, you know, the, the peace fellows and the peace poles and the uh, the peace centers all could come together in one unified, and we did it. Yeah, we did it again, making a difference. Yeah. Um, so, um, oh, and about two years ago, I decided to move over to Newburgh to work with Mike and um, working on different projects. I work on local projects, regional projects, national projects. Um, and international projects. The majority of them are peace-related, but um, like I'm working as the economic facilitator for the city of Lafayette, which is has a pretty depressed downtown, mm -hmm. so we're working to revitalize that. I have several small companies that I advise in McMinnville um, looking to revitalize the Bayou Golf Course and build an event center in McMinnville, but most of the work that I, I really enjoy um, is um, working uh, to help end gun violence mm. in Portland uh, with the Portland Peace Initiative and working with several black owned um, nonprofits um, to recruit young men into activities that are not gang related. Yeah. Working on placing peace poles um, in Northern Oregon where we've placed 500 peace poles, but working with Al Jubitz and Dennis Wong and Kevin Munn and Ray Matsumiya, who are, are really heavily involved in Rotary Peace Programs to do a peace pole initiative globally. Yeah. We're working in Armenia, Georgia, and Russia. At least we were working in Russia. I have a youth. It sounds like the Russia is not super interested in peace right now. <laughs> Russia is right now. They have turned off all all rotary activities. Mm -hmm. So, but we're still working in Armenia and Georgia and uh, Africa. Uh, tomorrow, I have a uh, a meeting, a virtual meeting with the. Uh, Forest Grove Rotary Club, where Emily Bakita is going to present her Rise to Shine Foundation, which keeps kids in school in Kenya. Um, we're working, placing peace poles with our Mandela Fellows in Africa. We have 25 African leaders visit us mm -hmm. five years ago. Um, and what's interesting is Almost all of these activities are interrelated. Okay. Um, it, it's hard for me to go to a meeting now where I don't recognize a face or two. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I get I get a a lot of satisfaction because I can see that we are making a difference. Yeah. So you moved from California originally back to Oregon because you had grandkids here, mm -hmm. um, and then you were. Is that when you had officially retired from your kind of regular daytime job, or was that there was no official retirement? It okay. was just a transition. Yeah, because a lot of people will go into you know they'll work until their whatever age they'll retire to where you know they basically go from working every day to then they're just at home doing whatever they do. But for you, you got involved. It sounded like what started as a breakfast meeting, and then what has led to all of these different activities. Um, do you kind of see that as the kind of the, the key thing that led to all this? Or do you feel like you would have, maybe that you're just the type of person who would have found a way to get involved anyway? Um, I think I became a different me. Um, uh, sitting home all day watching TV or reading doesn't sound very attractive. Uh, I'm not very good at fixing things around the house. So my wife 
doesn't ask me to do things like that. <laughs> um, so this was just like a lot of things in my life that just happened. And the ability to take advantage of that happening is, is kind of how my whole life evolved. Hmm. Um, you know, meeting with Kelly Mackey, getting involved with the Satellite Communications Agency, um, getting picked to go out to San Francisco, mm -hmm. uh, which got me involved in Silicon Valley. All of these were chance happenings that one took advantage of, yeah. but, but were not planned. Yeah. Um, uh, sitting in Brooklyn, New York, there wasn't a lot of planning on your future. And yeah. uh, my, my dad got a degree in night school in accounting. My mother Never went to college. All four of my grandparents came from what's now Ukraine. Okay. Uh, they never had a high school education. Um, so I guess I was the first one. Uh, and, you know, going to Bucknell was because one of our neighbors um, happened to know someone at Bucknell. Mm. I did a trip there that seemed like a really nice place to go. Got accepted. Um so Bucknell led to ROTC, which led to the Satellite Communications Agency, which led to Silicon Valley, which led to two kids moving to Oregon, which left to Oregon, and right. then Kelly Menke and the breakfast meeting. And now we're involved in, oh, probably 10 to 12 different projects. Um, all of them, you know, on a daily basis keep me involved. I have Zoom calls mostly every evening, during the day, maybe five to six hours of Zoom calls, in-person meetings, writing grant requests, um, just moving things from one place to another place. Yeah. So, and I want to get into some of the specific projects you're a part of, but I know that'll take up a fair amount of time. So kind of as we get into that, because you've kind of brought, kind of painted with a broad brush, some of the things you're involved in, what would you say to someone who... Um, who has retired that they're, maybe that's what they're doing. There's watching TV or they're reading books every day. And maybe what, what would you say, or what do you say when people talk to you and they find out all the things that you're doing, maybe they say, Oh, I would never want to do that. Or it sounds too stressful. Or how do you respond to those people? Or what do you say? Um, I, I think you want to have to make a difference. Um, it's not hard to join a, a service organization. It's not expensive. It doesn't take a lot of your time. Um, but I think it, you have to have some inner yearning to make a difference. I know, um, you know, I, I don't need limelight. I, I don't need to have, you know, a, something shining on me. I just get up in the morning and I know I have things to do and I do them because they're worthwhile. They make a difference. And I think if, if you look at all of the projects, they have one word that kind of describes that. Maybe not for the economic development work, but youth. Hmm. The Peace Village is about youth. Ending gun violence in Portland is about youth. Most of the peace polls that we plant are in elementary schools and middle schools and high schools. Yeah. So um, we have a monthly youth conversation with kids in Krasnyevsk and Yekaterinburg and St. Petersburg and Moscow and Omsk. And uh, my grandkids are involved in that. Uh, some people in Denver, some people in Chicago. And uh, we have a one hour talk. It's very non-political. Mm -hmm. It's about what you watch on Netflix, and the kids are 13 to 16, and the kids in Russia are just the same as the kids in the United <laughs> States. And, and that's the purpose, is to understand that there really is no difference. Hmm. Uh, that's the purpose of Peace Village, yeah. um, is, uh, is it getting kids to understand that even if someone doesn't look the same, doesn't speak the same, doesn't eat the same, that we're all the same. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really important. I mean, especially now, even, I mean, with the conflict in Russia, I think it's really easy to vilify Russian people that may have nothing to do with what's going on. And that's good. Goes for any, um, 
any people group that is is different in in some way. So I think that's that's really great. Yeah, and the you know we talked with Christina Saturday morning who has had to relocate to Germany is living in a boarding house mm. because of her family situation. Um, Alana um, is of Jewish heritage. Her family has a very successful business in Krasnyovsk. They're going to have to move mm. um, to Israel. Um, uh, Constantine is in... Um, and these are all people with it. These are the Russian young okay. ladies okay. we've been talking to. Constantine had to leave St. Petersburg, and he's looking to reconcile with his family in the U.S. sometime next year. So, you know, even though these are Russians with, with they have nothing to do with the conflict, the conflict's affecting them. Right. So getting to some of the, the specific things, I know you've touched on some of them. What right now would you say is, and it, <laughs> I, it may be a tough thing to say, like, what's your favorite, but what is, what is one of the ones that is maybe you're spending a lot of time right on? A lot of time on right now that you would say is um, especially fulfilling or you feel like is making yeah, especially I, an impact? I, I've been with Peace Village Global for eight years on the board, and we are working right now in two specific areas. Uh, Peace Village started in um, 27 years ago in Lincoln City with a horrifying um, um uh, two kids were, were beat up and put in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So the Siletz tribe, uh, a church, and Peace Village got together and they created a camp. And that camp has spread to 30 different cities around, oh, wow. um, but, but also to developing a curriculum on nonviolence and mindfulness and respect for each other. Yeah. So we're working now... Uh, we did a peace village in Kenya. We did one in Beirut, or outside of Beirut, in Tripoli, Lebanon. But we're working in Syria right now. And uh, Lizzie is going to, Lizzie is the executive director. She'll be in Germany next month with the woman working with displaced youth uh, to introduce them to how to express themselves through art and music and um, through um, making film. Yeah. And uh, she's also working with uh, Lionel Irving, who runs Love is Stronger, several other black-owned uh, um, nonprofits, and five Rotary Clubs to do a youth leadership training in Portland next summer, which we hope will be sustainable on a year-to-year -year basis mm -hmm. to, again, get kids off the street and get them involved in something yeah. That has nothing to do with gangs and nothing to do with revenge or getting even. Um, I, I'm working with a gentleman now who played with the Chicago Bulls for three years and the Atlanta Hawks for a year, uh, Thomas Gardner, who runs a basketball camp in Portland. And he has about 150 kids that come there three times a week. Yeah. And um, they focus on social activities and basketball and then kids don't have time to think about anything <laughs> that's um gang related yeah and is this all under the umbrella of peace village global or this least... is under um related to it's okay. under it's under rotary gotcha okay the peace portland peace initiative was rotary started we have a rotary um meeting every Saturday morning for an hour and a half, which started by uh, Lake Oswego Rotary and Al Jubitz. Um, it's, it's a racial justice meeting. That's 40 to 50 people. Mm. We've had the mayor of Portland. Um, it's really focusing in on why why does Portland have this violence going on? And yeah. it's, it's not stopping. It's increasing. Mm -hmm. It's youth-related. Youth related. Every week we they talk about this child was killed or this child was injured, and there's no reason yeah. behind it all. Yeah. So, um, you know, again, everything is kind of interrelated. Yeah. Well, that's the thing I love about Rotary, and the longer I've been in it, the more I've 
learned that there are so many projects like this that most people will never hear about. Even people within Rotary are probably unfamiliar just because there's so many things. Many people have heard of Rotary as being, um, you know, they, they may know it's a service club. They may know, oh, they give out scholarships, but most people have no clue that the depth and breadth of what Rotary does. Which... And most people don't even not know what Rotary does. So yeah. this project I'm working on with uh, people around the country is to put a QR code on peace poles. Hmm. So when you're walking through a park or near a school, you just, you know, just yeah. put your phone on the QR code and it'll open up the world of Rotary. Yeah. Uh, we're still not sure whether it should be national, international, or local. But it will provide a, a vision of the service projects and the reason why Rotary exists. Rotary's been there for over 100 years. Yeah. And it's done so much. I mean, even um, most people now know polio as a vaccine, but not polio as the disease. And um, I mean, that's, and that's just one of so many, you know, just a little tiny piece of the tip of the whole iceberg of Rotary. And I think that's why it's great to just get involved. And part of why I wanted you to come and share today, because you are involved with so many things. And for people who have no idea what Rotary is about, this is just kind of a... Um, it can be about so many things. There's not like one thing. Well, there's seven there's... avenues of focus from the environment to uh, uh, economic development in third world countries to getting rid of polio to peace projects, mm -hmm. uh, clean water, um, et cetera. Yeah. And then on a more local level within that, here in Newburgh, the Noon Club is focused more on youth. So youth development, youth um, services, that kind of thing. And then there's also morning club and they focus on more of the, the brick and mortar, that kind of thing. Um, but you're involved kind of at a much broader level cause you're connecting with several other rotary clubs around the. Yeah. Country, I, right? I talk to different rotary clubs every week and, yeah. um, um, and every rotary club has its own personality and, uh, the personality actually continues whether the, and the president changes every year and the board changes every year. Mm -hmm. But the Rotary Clubs kind of stay focused on what they do and what yeah. they do best. Yeah. Can you share another um, another project you're working on that you feel is especially relevant right now? Uh, yeah, this is a new one, uh, but I've been working with a woman, um, Ian uh, Nicole, in Portland, mm. who, uh, and, and she spoke at our Rotary yeah. not too long mm -hmm. ago, um, Nicole Brewster. She runs a nonprofit called Elevate Him. And I am on the board recently, as of last week, okay, uh, working to help her partner and help her raise funds. 11 years ago, her best friend and her brother committed suicide. Uh, after her birthday party. It was mm. on a Friday night a celebration. Everybody was happy. And she got a phone call the next morning that Bill Brewster had committed suicide. Her life has changed and has changed and will always be changed. So she's dedicated herself now to helping men in crisis. Mm. Uh, she's not a mental health professional. Um, she's not a hotline. But People search her out, and she has saved lives of several men in the six months I've known her. She um, clothes men who come out of prison who are looking for a job. She gives them haircuts. She coaches them on how to present themselves at a job interview. Um, and she's really a wonderful human being. So helping her helps me. Yeah. Again, service above self. Yeah. Um, so I, I'd like doing that. Yeah. 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 I remember when she came and spoke, that was a pretty powerful, um, powerful message. And I think just so needed. I mean, like what you said, it is needed right now because anytime I think there's when we're going into an economic downturn, especially, and it's any time, but when, um, I think there's a lot of pressure on men and there's not really a lot of services, I get, and I'm not, services isn't even the right word, but there's men are often told you have to suck it up. You have to get over, you have to get through it or whatever. And that works 
up to a point until, you know, if they don't have anyone that they can confide in. Well, they... You know, some men get put in prison for whatever reasons, and then the door opens one day and says, you're out. And that's as much as the government helps. Right. Yeah. So she fills that gap. Yeah. And what was nice about Rotary is she got a standing ovation after her speech, and that made her day and her month and her year. It gave her renewed vitality to, to do what she does. Yeah. I'm sure that's not an easy thing to be bearing those burdens, too. So, um, yeah, that is definitely a good program to be involved. I mean, another thing, we have Natalia, who's from the Beaverton Club, but she's from Armenia. And she's now in Armenia working on peace projects mm. in uh, Armenia. Who, who Armenia is at war with Azerbaijan um, in Georgia, um, and she was working very closely <coughs> with seven Rotary clubs in Russia. Mm. Um, so we talk once a week, um, but I helped her raise the money to get her to Armenia to do what she's doing. Mm. So um, again, all of these things kind of make me feel good. They are not, in my mind, hard work. And they take hours here and there. Sometimes it's hard for me to realize um, from a previous conversation which activity was that conversation in. <laughs> yeah. So, but... Yeah, all in all, um, again, the day in the life of a Rotarian, I am um, spending more hours doing what I love to do right now than I've ever done in my career. Yeah, and you mentioned um, you mentioned a few minutes ago that you feel like you're a changed person. Do you feel like that's, like, looking back, I'm sure, I mean, is it just like a slow evolution, or do you feel like there was a time where you felt like something shifted inside and changed? I it was the the rotary world opened up a different world for me mm. because the projects that I am working on are invisible to most people. Mm. Um, so I, it, the world of rotary, you know, which is you know thirty five thousand clubs and one point five million people, uh, changed my vision. Yeah, and um, that was a good thing. Yeah. We have probably time for one more project. I wish we could talk about all of them, but I think we could go in depth for a couple hours to, to go through every single one. What, one project, um, my McMinnville um, Peace Village, it was related to this. I mentioned the Mandela Fellows. We had, we had 25 African leaders from sub-Saharan Africa visit Portland uh, mm -hmm. five years ago. They were, they spent, I think it was 90 days at Portland State, but we got them to come to McMinnville and Newburgh for, for one day. We took them out to the museum where the Spruce Goose is located. Okay. And so we spent a whole day with them and um, we got in, we had the museum prepare an African lunch. And we've stayed with several Rotarians. We've stayed friends. And so right now we're working on planting peace poles in 16 of those countries. And we've started in uh, Kenya and Botswana. Um, but what we've created and what we've created with Emily in, in Kenya and with... Uh, Reem in, in Syria um, are friends, international friends, yeah. um, in places where they're struggling. Um, so that international aspect of what I do is, is especially with, with grandparents who came from Ukraine um, and working to help Ukrainians, working to help our young Russian friends and helping the people in Africa. And um, so that's an, another part of me that, that feels good. So working with youth, working with international um, countries that are struggling, um, and then working locally in a local community. Yeah. You know, one of the things I appreciate about you, Larry, is, well, most people will turn on the news and they'll talk about it and they'll talk about all the negative things that are happening. 
is you kind of sidestep that and you just get involved. You do what you can. And granted, you're only one person and you're one person who does a lot, but you're still one person that you said, hey, I can do what I can do and I'm going to be involved in this way. And one of the reasons I reached out specifically to you to share all of this is if every person were, every retired person were to do what you do, I think our world would be a much different place. Yeah, I don't watch the news. <laughs> the news is negative. So everything I try and do is positive. Yeah. And, and I think there's, there's really something to that because I, I heard it said, um, the news, their, their job supposedly is to tell us what's going on, but their business is to keep us watching. And they find by sharing all the negative, you know, sensational things, that's what keeps people watching. But, you know, it doesn't keep me watching. It doesn't keep you watching, but cause you have a, you have a purpose, you live your life with a purpose. And, and I, again, the reason I wanted for you to share is because I think it's inspiring and you're one of those people who you do all of this stuff, unless someone were to have a conversation or to listen when you spoke at Rotary, they would have no clue. And you kind of like that, right? You don't like being in the limelight. That's not why you're doing it. And I think that's why it's so important for people to, to see and hear about it because it's not about being in the limelight. Like, you know, that makes no, no difference. It's, um, but there are people like you who are doing amazing things locally and internationally. And I just want this to be an inspiration for anyone listening that, you know, your life can be about so much more than, um, than just your close circle and focus on yourself. But I think when you, like Larry was saying, when you, when you turn your focus outward and begin looking for ways that you can be involved and help, um, I'm sure you found so much more fulfillment than, you know, you probably could. But I reached an age where I had the time to do that. Yeah. Uh, I look at my two sons who are both involved in raising families and job-related activities and family activities. Um, and, it's, you know, I, I would love them to join Rotary, but they don't have the time right now. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, as they get to that certain age, they might have the motivation to do the same thing. Yeah. And at every stage, it looks different. I mean, I have much less time right now than I probably will, well, maybe you know, in the future. But, um, I think having, even if it's only 1% of your time, whereas maybe that ratio can change, but really for the people who are at your stage of life, are they, whether they're teens and they're during the summer, they've got nothing to do except either cause trouble or play video games or whatever, or if someone's retired. And I think a lot of people just don't know what opportunities there are. So they just go with the path of least resistance. And I like what you said of so many things happen by chance of, you know, you had that, that meeting with, with Kelly and got involved in Rotary. Um, and you know, this episode for some people might be that to recognize, oh, wow, there's, there's a whole other world about out there. Yeah. I met my wife at a chance meeting that if I didn't go to that party that one night, I never would have met her. <laughs> Yeah. So the same thing with Kelly. I don't know what would have happened if I didn't go to that rotary meeting. So what the last 10 years would have been like. Yeah. They wouldn't be the same. Yeah. So given what, what you're doing and what, how much you've been involved in, I like uh, asking this next question of what gives you hope for the future of Newberg? Kids. Hmm. The youth we meet all the time are somewhat different. Um, I think uh, this Generation Z they're talking about thinks differently. Mm. Um, but um, between the Peace Village camps and the youth conversations in Russia and uh, the kids are meeting in the basketball camps in Portland, that's what gives me confidence for the future. Yeah. Well, thank you, Larry, so much. Is there any closing remarks you'd like to make to anyone listening to this? Um. No, I just think uh, take a look at uh, how you how you want to live your life, and helping others is not a bad way to do it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Well, thank you, Larry. Appreciate you. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your heart for our community and just for service in general. I think you do an excellent job of exemplifying what Rotary is all about. Good. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed hearing Larry's story and are inspired to find ways where you can make a difference as well. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider sharing it with a friend who you think would enjoy listening to it as well. 
Well, thanks for tuning in and I'll catch you in the next episode.